I'll just go ahead and give a quick intro on our panel and tee up the conversation. Um, so a big hello and welcome to the Future of Workplace panel, the New York City edition. I, I really am very excited for this particular event, not just because of the topic itself, but for the panelists that we have in this conversation. So wherever, where else could you find a deal maker, a strategist, and a futurist that are all focused on the workplace, but all with very competing views on what the future of the workplace will look like? So to start, when we say the future of anything, it's somewhat of a double-edged sword. Discussing the future is a way to kind of pause and discuss new realities, but we do that at a distance, almost like at a far off point in a future that doesn't really impact me today. But we all know that that's not the case and that the definition of the workplace is rapidly changing and on a global scale, and particularly as we enter a post-COVID world of work. So what I'll do is discuss the changing nature of the workplace and the employee of the future. I'll hand it off to my friend, Phil, who will discuss how companies are designing workplace strategy today. And Phil will hand it off to Eric, who will respond with the hard and cold facts of how deals are being done today in response to the changing nature of work. So what we hope that you will get from this talk is to understand what's changing and how to respond. So we've designed this panel without slides intentionally because we want it to be conversational, which means that we are just genuinely interested in what it is that you have to say and the questions you have. So we would absolutely encourage you to engage in the conversation and answer and drop any questions that you have in the chat, because I know that we'll have Walter we'll moderate an open Q&A towards the end of the session. So my talk at the conference here is going to be a little bit different to what you've heard so far in other panel sessions. I'm a workplace futurist and founder at Sway Workplace, and that means that I think very deeply about the future of the workplace. Uh, to start with that, the future is, is not about predicting the future. There is no crystal ball. It really is an analytical approach that looks at not only the historical patterns, but the existing signals around us to create plausible scenarios for what the future may hold. It's about making informed decisions today to shape the future that we want to live in. My specific area of focus is on the future of the workplace. And in my work, I seek to draw a picture of what the workplace will look like in 10 years from now, based on what I see happening around me today. So with that in mind, I wanna share with you the five signals that I believe will shape the future of the workplace. The first single signal is that flexible work is not a fad or a corporate perk. It's an emergent trend and a systematic response to the changing nature of the workplace. And what I mean by that is that there are three parts to the world of work. And in your mind, if you can visualize three circles, one circle is the worker, one is the work being done, and the third is the workplace. And these three parts come together and overlap. And at the center is the value where an employee creates value for the company. Meaning that since we became agriculturist, right through even all the industrial revolutions, the worker could only access the work being done at the workplace. And these parts were completely independent. The value and central and singular workplace, and that could have been the farm, the factory, the office, was unquestioned over the past 100 years. And that is actually only the place where work happened until very recently. So what really changed over the last 100 years is that once the work being done moved to the cloud, it became, it completely changed the game because the worker was no longer dependent on the workplace to access the work being done. And the worker now exists also in physical and in virtual format. And the workplace itself exists in multiple physical locations and also in a virtual format. So that is to say that the hybrid workplace is not gonna go away. It simply can't. And it's the case that we can't go back because the system itself has fundamentally changed and that has caused a permanent change in the definition and the nature of the workplace. The second signal that I follow that informs my thinking on this is an extension of number one, what is that changing definition of the workplace? So like we said, nothing in the system of work has really changed in the past 100 years until now. And that's a really, really big statement to make. And it's big because it means that we are at the point where we must redefine and modernize the meaning, the nature, the value and the utility of the workplace to adapt to the worker of the future. The question is, how do we respond to that? The worker sees the workplace not as a single building, but more of a portfolio of options to choose from every day. So it's like waking up in the morning and looking at a menu. 
where will I work from today? My home office, my local co-working, a distributed company hub, the headquarter building, the library, or the coffee shop. Not only is the location itself variable, but the time that each person spends at each location is also variable. So I find this really interesting because the real question then becomes how do workplace providers, operators, and the tenants collaborate in a new way to evolve the business models to service the portfolio of the workplace? And anything that's short of this is an incomplete solution for the future of work. The third signal that I follow is what I call the new use case for the workplace. And this really speaks to the shift in how people are using the workplace. And that means that we have to redefine its purpose. The traditional office first setting is easy to manage. There's a central headquarters where people gather every day and it's where all work happens. But this changes when the workplace becomes a portfolio of options. Now the portfolio of option exists because people are starting to examine how they work and where they work best. They're seeking to alleviate burnout and work more efficiently by more clearly understanding what part of their job is best done away from the office and what part is best done together. So in hybrid terms, this is the difference between distributed and co-located work. So we also find that people are also really looking for efficiency gains by examining what work must be done together at the same time versus what kind of work can be done together at different times. And in hybrid terms, this is the difference between synchronous and asynchronous work. So the portfolio of workplace options exists because there is a complete rewiring underway of how work gets done. So in short, that is to say that the workplace is no longer where all the work gets done. It truly is where the most collaborative work happens. And the question here then is how workplace providers are evolving their business models to adapt to this fundamental change in the purpose of the workplace. So the fourth signal that I follow is, and I really love this one, it's about the data we don't yet have. And it's what I call the next frontier. We tend to think of data as absolute, meaning that the data that I can record today, hold in my hand and share, tells the full story, We're reliant on that to make decisions. So prop tech, sensors as a service are really innovative approaches that reduce operational costs, improve utilization, and generally make it easier and more convenient for people to move around. But what's beyond building efficiency data metrics? Meaning, what is the data that we are not yet recording that matters? So I envision a future where the workplace experience becomes complete and whole where companies are directly linking employee well-being goals to the workplace experience. And the measurable question becomes, how do employees feel in the workspace? What is their experience in the workspace? Does the environment around them in the workplace lead to heightened or reduced levels of stress? Is the employee physically comfortable at all times or do people, and do people feel creatively optimized? And ultimately, do they feel a sense of safety? So could this be a future where we have an opt-in personal wearable that anonymously links to prop tech features to can provide a complete data footprint on the value derived from the workplace? I think so. The workplace experience is now in the battle chest in the war for talent in the future of work. So the fifth signal that I track and it's somewhat of an extension of the other four is that it's the move towards human-centered workplace design. In a lot of ways, it's a reflection of what we've already discovered. And what I mean by that is in an AI influenced world of work, it is widely anticipated that AI will perform up to 60 to 70% of the worst tasks that are currently done by the average knowledge worker. So when this body of workers are freed from monotonous and labor intensive tasks, people at work will have an increasing amount of bandwidth to focus on those capabilities that are uniquely human leaning on our sense of intuition and developing our innate skills of creativity, collaboration, problem solving, and teamwork for the purpose of ideating, creating new products, services, and solutions to solve the problems of the upcoming century. So the question here remains, if we can create workplaces of the future that elevate human capabilities. So those are the five signals that I'm tracking and watching the emerging trend and evolution that will shape how the workplace of the future is used by the employee of the future. 
So if I was kind of to sum this up and wrap it all up, um, I envisioned the Workplace of the Future as a collaborative space designed around lifestyle and human-centered design. I think that these workplaces will be technologically advanced and fully equipped in ways we're not even yet doing today. I think that the workplace will be not a singular location, but a portfolio of physically, physically distributed and virtual options where teams sway in and out in a rhythm that optimizes their creativity and productivity. This is how I see the future of the workplace evolving. Now, it's quite a different take and understanding probably what you heard so far, which is why I'm thrilled to have this particular panel together. But the next question is, what are workplace operators doing today to adapt to the evolving workplace of the future? So to answer that question, I'm gonna hand off to my esteemed fellow panelist, uh, Phil Kirshner. Thank you, Denise. Um, really fascinating view on, on to the long look of where we're going with workplace. And I'll try to offer a couple comments on um, sort of the reality of how operators and, and and occupiers uh, are thinking about this as a, as a real strategy. Um, first and foremost, it's, it's really odd as a workplace strategist, someone who's who's been in this game as a practitioner, as a consultant, as a service provider, or a kind of product leader from the WeWork side, um, to kind of wake up one morning a year ago and have the entire world um, be a workplace strategist. Everybody is intensely interested in, in this topic in a way that they haven't um, before. Uh, but those of us who have been thinking about it for a long time really do see the pandemic as uh, an accelerant of existing demand for change in workplace, not something that has radically altered the course that we were already on before. Um, I think now, uh, as far as workplace strategy, many large occupiers for years have been exploring like, what we know uh, and call kind of activity-based working uh, or some variation of mobility in the office before, uh, there were certainly some large scale remote working programs, but it was much more common to be uh, exploring ways that we can share space once we're in the office collaborating together. Uh, and I think there's a real um, kind of divergent in, in latent capability for the companies that were exploring that before versus those that never explored it and have now had COVID. Uh, fo forcing their hand to have to think about programs um, where you're providing direct guidance on how you are supposed to work in space or uh, use spaces in the course of your kind of working day and week. Um, companies and, and operators that had explored like mobility or co-working before are accustomed to providing those nudges and the technology and vertically integrating the experience. Um, whether or not they, they would have considered to have perfected that system, they have experience doing it. Uh, for companies that were still occupying space in more of a traditional fashion, uh, the idea of even like putting a sign up to say, you should behave in such and such a way, uh, whether it's about like sharing a meeting room or you know eating or whatever it is, uh, may feel foreign now, which just compounds the problem that they have to tackle uh, in coming back from COVID when the expectations around flexibility are so high. Um, Following that, uh, hybrid is the new norm a little bit, as you said, Denise. Um, mm -hmm. I think that is a both an opportunity and a handcuff um, for a lot of large occupiers. Uh, if you take up a lot of space in this world today, um, it is not practical that you will become a fully remote company and uh, your employees are giving you a strong enough signal that you can't go back to being fully in the office or not at least without uh, a degree of turmoil. Um, so you're stuck in the gray space of hybrid where um, you know the game is in theory simple, but uh, there's a significant amount of variability in who will like play it really well and who will win. Um, and dealing with the, the tensions and interplay between what the company thinks it can control and, and recommend mm -hmm. for people's behaviors and what the employees will want to do. Uh, and as you rightly said, Denise, this will require a, a significant investment in technology and experience holistically um, and a degree of, of kind of authenticity and willingness to fail that is really uncommon in the, the corporate real estate world traditionally. Um, real estate groups are used to making big lumpy decisions once and kind of set it and not having the ability to react or make much change between large leases, especially here uh, in the States where it's still common to sign kind of a 10 or 20 year lease. Um, so moving into a modality where you have to be reactive to changes that are going to be very rapid um, is uncomfortable. Uh, that is going from a supply perspective to contribute to the absolutely explosive uh, growth of the demand on uh, kind of co-working flex and serviced office that was happening absolutely before 
uh, before the pandemic, but um, I think is getting a, a, a dose of credibility now um, as a release valve for you know, for the risk that companies don't want to take. Uh, from the, the corporate side, it's I have to have more variability in my, my portfolio and responsiveness than I did before because I have no idea what the future is bringing. And from the landlord and, and occupier per, or the provider perspective, I think a global recognition that like if you're not providing the ability for people to flex within your portfolio uh, or engage with your space that you're providing in different ways, um, they're going to look somewhere else because if you don't do it, the building next door will. Um, with all of this, uh, I think it is uncomfortable but necessary that uh, employers in particular start to kind of let the leash out. Um, and give employees a chance to, to roam a bit and show them what they want and how quickly they want it on the way back in um, from sort of our, our pandemic remote working experience. That again is incredibly uncomfortable for most uh, corporations that are used to viewing real estate as a highly controlled expense. Um, the idea of giving teams flexibility to make a choice to go and drop into a flexible space or share space differently week over week is terrifying. Um, but I think, again, a necessary evil in this um, post-pandemic flex is king uh, workplace strategy approach. Um, Denise, absolutely, you hit the nail on the head when it comes to uh, focusing on changing work patterns and their demand on space. So the a realization, even though you may be hybrid by necessity because you, you aren't big enough to, or you're too big to be full remote, can't go back to the office, so you're stuck in hybrid, but to enable hybrid uh, involves embracing um, working best practices of the companies that actually are the most distributed and remote. And the big one there is a focus on like asynchronous communication and reducing demand on synchronous time. Um, the fear from a supply side of, of what brings us all back together is like, how and when are we going to meet and how much of what is there going to be? And it's very easy for a real estate group to focus on the supply side of the problem instead of engaging on the demand and challenging why is it that you want to come together? Um, because it is impossible to make location-based sort of choices during the day if you don't actually have the freedom in your schedule uh, to command your own time. Um, we can't do it when we're all on eight hours or 10 hours of, of Zoom calls every day uh, or even in real time um, meetings. And I guess that brings me to the sort of last point that all of this um, with the clients that I'm talking to is much more of a comprehensive change journey than people are realizing. And the biggest recommendation I, I often provide is like not to think of your future state for your company as the one that you are being forced into because you are uh, thinking about like a hybrid existence, um, but rather to be intentional and to combine what you knew to be true from before the pandemic to what you're learning during the pandemic and uh, setting something intentional about the future of what you want it to feel like to work for your company and how you want the work to be controlled uh, and guide people towards um, towards that future and not one that is uh, driven out of crisis of coming back into the office and having to figure it out. Um, being intentional, managing like a change and uh, recognizing that it's going to take very different capabilities and skill sets and um, kind of mission and driving values for the real estate group from human resources and IT and everyone who has to collaborate to make it together uh, to do this. So really exciting times and I'm very, uh, thrilled to kind of hand it, hand it to Eric to hear the the practical deal oriented side of what's happening in a market like New York and uh, and elsewhere with all of this uh, taken in mind. Great, thank you, Phil. Um, and great thoughts. And I can touch on a lot of this. And I agree with a lot of what you said and what Denise has said. So, you know, it's a it's a time of lots of questions. And never have we seen, um, you know, from where I sit, representing occupiers in New York and globally. Uh, so many stakeholders and so many organizations engaging with our team to have these conversations. And no one knows the answers, right? But it's certainly an interesting conversation and journey to your point, Phil. And, and um, you know, I think some of the points you made regarding flight to quality and, and COVID not creating any um, trends, but really accelerating a lot of trends around flex, around amenitization and hotelization the need to have an experience, to your point, Denise, to have flexibility and let the employee direct and really have an honest voice in the organization and, and how they interact with that organization through um, an experience in the office, 
also through different modalities, through technology and the, and, and the home and maybe other pubs, all super interesting. Um, let me take a step back for a minute and just give a little bit of boots on the ground perspective. So I sit in obviously New York, I come to the office almost five days a week. Um, New York feels uh, markedly more busy um, than it ever has. You know, today was a big day with CDC and New York City and New York State guidelines being lifted further. Um, it feels relatively normal. You know, my office sits uh, above Grand Central and it feels busy, the weather's wonderful. I think there's a lot of optimism in the air, a lot of optimism in the office. Of course, we, you know, we've had an unprecedented economic downturn, and it's going to take a lot of time um, for us all to understand what this means for the office and how this impacts the footprint of the office. And I think we could have a lively discussion here about what that really means and, and the importance of the office. But I will say that, you know, even looking at our models and speaking with um, our, our, our clients, um, anecdotally, um, th th there's a strong preference to have some engagement in the office and soon, two to three days in the office, a hybrid working model where employees can come in on a rotational basis starting in June or July, um, or, or really shooting for that Labor Day date in September where people can come back. Listen, the property markets as we look at them are going to lag and there will be a significant, and there is a significant um, vacancy rate in New York, both on a direct basis and on a sublease basis. That being said, as these as these decision makers and stakeholders survey their, their employees and start to reoccupy and plan for that hybrid work, they say, you know, we need to engage with our workplace team or people like Phil or Denise and say, what does that new workplace look like? Is it more activity based? Is it more neighborhood? Do we really need less space? And a lot of people are saying, we're not sure yet but we're not gonna make any big moves. And I think one of the most interesting data points I saw this week was just in the last um, two weeks, we've seen 500,000 feet of space removed from the market, subway space that had been put on the market during the pandemic that has now been removed by large occupiers who said, wait, we don't necessarily, we might need this space. So, you know, we might be 200 people and maybe we had, you know, 220 desks before, Maybe we don't, you know, maybe in a hybrid model, we only need 180, but we're going to do more soft seating. We're going to do more neighborhoods. We're going to do more team-based activity work for the people that need that, want that, the teams that work in that modality. And then there's other groups that we work with that might be at actually media and entertainment who have a big sales component, who need that experience. But then there might be the engineers, the content creators who need that focus time, but want to be in the office. You need more breakout areas. Again, accelerating that trend where there were already that need for breakout areas and quiet areas. And people will want to work at home. I think you're right, Denise. But some people will say, no, I want to be in because of their personal situations or other reasons. So need for a lot of clients calling today and saying, okay, theoretically, conceptually, I get it. We can handle our return to the office. Phase one, we're there. Phase two, help me with furniture. Like help me figure out how do I have more Zoom areas, breakout areas. And then there's this phase three conversation of the big question to Denise's point around prop tech. How does hardware, how does technology help deal with a, a long-term hybrid workforce where you've got to have engagement with the employees that are physically there and might not be physically there? And how do you deal with all the things that we know are so important around um, apprenticeships and culture and collaboration and um, things that are so important for the employee to grow and, 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 and feel connected to the organization and, and, and to reduce attrition. So, um, you know, I'm very positive uh, on the office and, and, and the future of the office, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and there's a lot of things that need to change. And I think the biggest thing we're seeing today is this flight to quality, this flight to access where we already have amenity space, you already have flex operators in place, whether it's a WeWork or an IWG or someone else where you can say, I can flex my business in this asset. The building has great windows and air and light and amenities for my employees. You know, I think there's gonna be a lot of struggles with the class, the, you know, the lower quality buildings in New York that might not have good air quality, might not have good window to core ratios. So you take a building like one Vanderbilt, which is a brand new development. They've had they've risked at least five hundred thousand feet of space in the last two quarters. The building's almost ninety five percent leased now because people 
people see the value in a brand new asset. Now that's a different price point, but there's lots of other assets in New York that are doing the same, where you've got a building like four times square that's got great amenities and you're seeing lots of technology and media and financial services companies, TikTok, NASDAQ, other large companies that are flocking to these buildings that have invested in the future of the office and the experience. So, you know, I'll leave it there and I guess we can open up for questions, but um, any thoughts, comments, Denise or Phil? Well, I mean, I just, I love that we had this three-way conversation, given the fact there's such three different perspectives. And Eric, your, your experience with what people are actually doing with the actual office space, that's really where the rubber meets the road. That's like a hardcore decision that people are making now that's going to impact the further out. So I love the idea that people aren't letting go in the office space. And truthfully, as a workplace futurist, I don't want to as a uh, uh, absolute setting. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Myself back there. Can you guys double there? there? OK. Um, so yeah, Eric, loved your data and your stats. Uh, Walter, do you have any questions for us? Or we could continue talking, but if you have any questions in the audience, that'd be excellent to hear. Yeah, well, I have, of course, uh, some, some questions uh, uh, for you. I don't know if we have any questions from the audience yet, but I will uh, uh, stay and, uh, and have a look on that as well. Um, but of course, the, the, there is a major shift in, in, in real estate and into uh, uh, office spaces, workplaces. Uh, but you guys are from uh, from New York, and in New York, of course, we had 9/11, uh, and 9/11 uh, had a huge impact. But after 9/11, we really bent, uh, went back to normal uh, quite fast. Is this this pandemic? The, of course, it accelerated a lot technology and a different kind of view on, on workplaces. But what do you think is going to happen when the pandemic is really uh, being uh, go out again? Uh, are we going back to the normal within in, within real estate really fast? Or wh what are your thoughts on that? I, I mean, I can speak from a like data perspective, and I can talk about my perspective on uh, like rents and the economy, and I can compare very quickly. There's you know what we saw after 9/11. You're right. There was this you know, doom and gloom. New York City will never return, and of course it did, stronger and better than ever. Um, and that peak to trough, you know, where we had rents decline by 40%, 40%. And it took two or three years for rents to return to where they were. And then we had the great financial crisis in 08, and we had rents drop 44%, almost half. And there was this, again, this big, big concern with, with how long would it take New York to return to where, um, where it had been pre-crisis. And, and, and it took... You know, again, another like six quarters, seven quarters, a year and a half, two years. And then we've had this great, you know, great boom. And, and then the pandemic hit completely different reasons. Um, and I'll tell you that we're predicting the market to drop, um, you know, 35, 40% on a net effective basis, very similar to what has happened in the past. So we also expect the market to stabilize economically. It already has, of course, but the market, the property market will lag. Um, we're expecting the market to bottom economically uh, sometime next year, middle of next year, end of next year. But it's going to take some time because of the, the, the pipeline of new developments, because of the changing workplace. And so it's very hard to throw a dart and say when, but we expect there to be a downturn in the asset market, the commercial office market, for the next couple of years, and probably in our baseline scenario, we will not get back to where we were before, probably until see, sometime in 2024 or 2025. So, you know, it's going to take some time because there's so much that Phil and Denise can talk more about. It's going to change. There are going to be tenants that are, and, and occupiers that say, we don't need as much space. We don't need any space. We're going to be remote first. Um, so it's a big question mark. And if we had the answer to that, we'd probably be doing something else right now. It sounds like you want to use my crystal ball, Eric, the one that I said yes. <laughs> around futurism. Yeah. Um, so just I'm going to add on very quickly to what Eric said. Um, you know, New York, New York, so good they named it twice, literally. You know, New York has a draw to it that will never evaporate. That will always be there. So people will always want to be in the city. Yeah. Now, my perspective is very different from Eric's. My perspective is from the user behavior and how do I think that's going to evolve over time. 
you know, this last year and a half in pandemic, we have as a group of labor unlearned habits and relearned new habits and set new expectations, what we expect of the workplace, which is why I lean heavily on the redefinition and reimagination of the purpose of the workplace. That is definitely changing. But the one thing that will also hold true is, and I mentioned earlier, I don't advocate remote first. I don't think that's a suitable solution for the majority of people. As humans, we need to be together. We energetically connect when we're together. 65 to 70% of communication is often nonverbal. There's a need to be in the office. It makes its value, and it's a manifestation of a company, the physical four walls. But we don't have to be there all the time. And there's a way to switch our thinking and our mindset to humanize the way that we work, to make ourselves just more balanced and more competitive in the future of work that allows us to redefine how we use the office as opposed to redefining the move on shrinking of the footprint of the office. And that's where, that's where I see the greatest evolution happening. Phil, I also have a question for you because uh, when I have a, uh, I'm a landlord and I, um, um, I have some, some, some office spaces in, in New York, what would your advice be to, uh, to do? Um, um, because it's, it's hard to make choices right now, but what is your best advice for, uh, for a landlord? Yeah, I think, you know, historically the line between um, tenant experience and employee experience has been pretty hard. We still see that in the, the prop tech space. Um, the, those two types of applications are marketed differently. And uh, historically, the act of you know, for, for a landlord, like getting access to the, uh, to the individual employees or, or people who are coming in and out of a building or convincing one of their, their tenant companies um, to let them do that was at least here pretty, pretty foreign. Um, but the, the way to win as a landlord, consistent with what we've all said about adding flexibility and, and focusing on experience is finding a way of, of marketing to, uh, to those companies that are still seeking space is that you can be as responsive and, uh, and complex as the company's future workplace strategy is going to be um, and making the experience compelling and focusing on uh, you know, what you might lose in, in total envelope, the amount of space that somebody is taking uh, on like, how do, you, how, do you make up, how do you make it compelling enough for them to continue to pay you higher rates on a per square foot basis and the, uh, because of the services, the data, the value that you are providing and not just the raw space. And, um, you know, it used to be pretty easy to, you know, invest in space and sit back and collect your rent, but like, that's not going to be the case anymore. Um, you, you have to do the work in order to, to be attractive. And I think, you know, for the, the class A buildings, like as Eric mentioned, like on, in the right places that have the right technology and uh, can prove themselves to be safe and healthy and uh, experiential, I think there's, there's great opportunity for you know, a city like New York that has a lot of second and third tier buildings that will struggle to make that kind of investment. It's gonna be really tough. We don't hear you, Walter, at least I don't of my microphone because it's raining a little bit here in Amsterdam so sometimes it drizzles uh, too hard and then uh, you get a lot of background noise but maybe the last question to you all which because it's of course it's um, uh, we don't know where it's going to uh, to end but uh, what uh, call to action or what kind of advice would you give to real estate professionals listening right now uh, on the future of, of workplace how can they um, prepare themselves the best I'll, I'll lead with that on a wrap up that I think that real estate, traditionally speaking, is a horizontal effort where there's lots of hands and people that touch it to get it from inception to a tenant, where I think the future of real estate, in particular future of the workplace, is a vert vertically integrated collaborative teamwork, where the data people need to speak to the hardware people, the hardware people need to speak to facilities people, the facilities need to speak to the workplace experience people. It's one conversation and it's one common language that to date has been quite bifurcated. And I think that those companies that are going to do well are those that create a common language amongst all the operators to create a vertically integrated approach to the future of work. Uh, mine, I guess, would be uh, the term retail no longer just applies to that you know, small store on the corner of your building. Um, your building and the workplace is being viewed, at least from the individual worker's perspective, as a retail-oriented decision every day. And we know what that feels like in our personal lives, the amount of technology that's being applied to it, the amount of experience that's being applied to it, and how uh, quickly people can 
can change their minds. And if you don't enter the, you know, bring that retail oriented mindset to like your investments, the provision of the services in your building and for the occupiers, the, the kind of spaces that you're designing and taking, then you will be left behind. The like retail and experience economy has come to real estate. Here it is, it's not going away. Um, and I think we'll hopefully we'll all be better for it. And I think I'll just add to that. And I think both well said, um, you know, integrated teams that approach the prob problem you know, with strategy and holistically will win the day. Um, communication across, you know, from workplace to transaction and advisory to data, the prop tech team, integrating all of these services is what clients are demanding on a global level. Um, and really having a strategy that can be implemented across a diverse team um, is the most important thing right now. And again, touching on all the service lines that a firm like ours or many others offer is um, what's needed for a sophisticated approach to delivering like a tailored solution for each client. Thank you very much on uh, on your your view and your takes on uh, on the future of, of the workplace. We are coming to uh, the United States uh, uh, on the 5th of December with uh, hopefully a whole group of, uh, of C-level uh, people. Uh, we're working on that trip right now um, with some amazing companies. So it would be great to, uh, to meet you in New York in December and to see a couple of amazing workplaces in, uh, in Manhattan. Um, so it would be great to work together on that as well. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great day uh, in New York and see you guys soon. Thanks, Walter. And girls, Thanks, of course, and Denise. Thanks, Walter. Thank Take you. care. You well. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.